As we celebrate our second Sunday of Advent, I invite you to join me in Matthew chapter 3. It will be in verses 1 through 12. And as you are turning there, I want you to think about in your life some of the most memorable quotes that you have ever heard. Maybe it was a word of wisdom or encouragement that someone shared with you at a crucial moment in your life. Or maybe it was something that you heard in an interview or a TED talk or a sermon that you read in a book, a famous line in a movie that really challenged you or inspired you to action in some way. There are many good ones out there, many solid sayings that have been uttered throughout history. Here are a few classic ones you may recognize. Be the change that you wish to see in the world. Gandhi. Never let the fear of striking out keep you from playing in the game. Babe Ruth. Every time you smile at someone, it's an action of love, a gift to that person, a beautiful thing. Mother Teresa. Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Forrest Gump. And finally, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Martin Luther King, Jr. Each of these, in their own ways, offer wisdom, encouragement, challenge, or comfort. They offer a different way of looking at life, a call to action, or some profound insight. But none of these great quotes, or many others that you'll hear, bear the call on your life that John the Baptist's short sermon in the wilderness of Judea does. Hear the word of the Lord from Matthew 3. It says, In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The word of the Lord. Did you catch it? In all of the hustle and bustle of the story, the different moving parts, and the different characters at play, the main punch of John's sermon is a one-liner. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. But let's back up for a second and examine the situation. What is the role of John here? Why is he a necessary part of bringing the kingdom of heaven in? Why is he used by God? We see here as Matthew reinterprets the words of Isaiah to point to John, that John is the voice of one. Uh, John is the voice calling out in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. In Luke 1, the angel of the Lord tells Zechariah that his son John will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. In verse 77 of Luke 1, through Zechariah's prophecy, we discover that John will prepare the way by giving his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of sins. John is a God-raised prophet. When promised to Israel through the prophet Malachi in Malachi 4-5, the Elijah to come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, when the son of righteousness, as Malachi says, um, the Messiah will arrive on the scene. So John's arrival should have signaled to the people that the coming of the Messiah would be very, very soon. John is God's man, sent to get a people ready to meet and receive Jesus. And one of the most obvious signs of this is that John is absolutely dressed the part. 
If there was a Halloween costume contest for most like Elijah, John would have won easily. In 2 Kings 1.8, Elijah is described as having a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. Coincidence? I think not. So here he comes. John's mission? To get the people ready for Jesus. His method? A simple message with a simple invitation. But as simple as the message may be, it's a message that calls for complete life reorientation. All wrapped up in one call to action. Repent with the reason for doing so. Because the kingdom of heaven has come near. These ideas are connected. Repentance is because of the nearness of the kingdom. And these ideas cannot be divorced from one another. So when John says, repent, he is commanding the people of Israel to turn from their lives of sin and pursuing their own ways of doing life, to turn back to pursuing obedience to God, his ways, his commands. This word has in mind the idea of a change in direction. Think about when a basketball player is running a line drill. They're running towards the baseline, they stomp their foot, turn on their hips, and they're, uh, they're off the other way. Think about if you had a dinner reservation in Little Rock at 6 p.m., and at 5.15, you're heading down 70, but you accidentally take the I-30 exit for Texarkana instead of Little Rock. Frustrating. You, as quick as you can, you would get off the interstate, take a left, get on the on-ramp back to Little Rock, and you'd be heading in the right direction. This is repentance. You're heading in one direction, you turn the other way. John the Baptist is preaching that the people of Israel need to quit heading in the wrong direction, turn back in the right direction. And they'd better do it quickly. Do you sense the urgency in John's tone? John is not suggesting that they mull over this idea of repentance or weigh out the pros and cons and consider if it would actually be worth their life change. It's an urgent message because the kingdom of heaven is in their midst. It is upon them as they speak. The long-awaited Messiah, who they would come to know as Jesus, was right on John's heels. In fact, before this chapter is even over, he is on the scene. Do you remember the movie Toy Story? When Andy, the owner, is gone, the toys can move about freely. They can talk, they can laugh, they can hang out, they can play, whatever they want. But when the lookout shouts, Andy's coming, they'd better get to their proper position quick. Whether that means falling on the floor, laying still, or hiding, but not talking, either they'd be found out. Andy's arrival elicited a response from the toys. And in a similar way, Jesus' coming elicits a response from his people. Rather than hit the floor and hide, they needed to turn their lives around. If they wanted to be ready for Jesus and his kingdom, they needed to repent. The coming of Jesus, the first advent, ramps up the pressure on the people. It meant the inauguration of the kingdom of heaven, a kingdom brought to earth initially by Jesus, a kingdom very much alive today in December of 2022, a kingdom that will be firmly established in its entirety for all of eternity when Jesus returns to earth at the second advent. It ramps up the pressure. Jesus is coming, but the kingdom of heaven coming with him. And the kingdom of heaven is a double-edged sword. It brings blessing for many and judgment for others. Jesus' is coming brings blessing and the forgiveness of sins for those who confess their sins and come to him to receive that forgiveness. It offers restoration of sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, strong legs to the lame, and good news to the poor. It offers the beginning of the reversal of a fallen world, the beginning of the reversal of the effects of sin that will come to completion at Jesus' return. And we have certain hope of this when the kingdom will be firmly established for all of eternity. And it's a kingdom with an open invitation to all who repent. But for those who are against God, who choose not to repent of their sins, to never repent, to never come to Jesus and seek forgiveness, and miss out, being on part, uh, miss out on being part of the kingdom, there is judgment. 
John does not sugarcoat this reality, as you can see in the text. John says, you'll be on one of two sides. You'll produce fruit in keeping with repentance. You'll be God's wheat that he gathers into his barn. You'll be a good tree, or you'll be a bad tree that is cut down. You'll be unrepentant. You'll be chaff thrown into an unquenchable fire. We cannot deny the fact that for the unrepentant, those who never repent, God's wrath and eternal separation from God awaits them. And which side they would be on depended on how they would respond to John's message. And which side you will be on depends on how you respond to John's message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Advent places a call on your life. Repent. It places a call on each of your lives, on my life. No one gets a free pass. The Pharisees and Sadducees approach the scene looking to see the spectacle. Surely they've heard about John and want to check him out, but they don't really feel the need to repent. They think to themselves, not only have we kept the law to a T, but we also are of the lineage of Abraham, and we are the leaders of God's people, so surely we are secure. We're secure as we can be. And John dispels this line of thinking in a heartbeat. God could raise up stones as children for Abraham. If they wanted to be saved, just like everyone else, they must bear fruit in keeping with repentance. They might have had a clean exterior, the Pharisees and Sadducees, but inside their hearts were corrupt, far from God. They were sinners too, as Jesus would say later. Their lineage doesn't make them secure. Their status doesn't guarantee them a spot. They must repent. John's words place a responsibility on each person to repent. In Romans, Paul says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means that every human being to ever live has sinned. That includes all of us sitting in this room today, those of you watching online, any living, breathing person outside of these walls or has lived throughout history. And what each of us deserve for our sin is to be separated from God for all of eternity and to endure eternal suffering in hell. In our sin, that is essentially what we are saying anyway. When we sin, it's like saying to God, I've got this. I think I'd rather do things my way instead of yours. I don't really need you in my life, God. God would be perfectly just in sending us to hell and away from his presence for all of eternity. But that's what makes the gospel so beautiful. Thanks be to God that this is not how the story goes. He did not leave us without a hope. He did not leave us as a bunch of wandering sinners all destined for hell. And he doesn't give us what we deserve out of God's great love and faithfulness, he sent his son Jesus to offer reconciliation and eternal life for the forgiveness of sins. Even despite all of our sin and our rebellion and our rejection of God and his commands, when we come to him, he will cancel our debts. He will present us as blameless and holy with the righteousness of Christ. This is such a great hope. And it all begins at Christmas with Jesus' entrance into the world as he leaves the riches of heaven to take on human flesh through Mary's womb to dwell among sinners he loved. And what is required of you to receive this eternal life, this hope of forgiveness of sins, is repentance, which means coming to Jesus. You are not just turning from sin to not sin. Repentance is foundationally about turning to Jesus and then following his ways rather than our own. So stop running from Jesus if you are and turn to him instead today. And coming to Jesus really means coming home. You aren't just choosing one way of many. You're not just choosing one road and hoping you end up at the right destination. Whoever you are, being with Jesus is home. Because the narrative of your life, of each of our lives, is that we were created in the image of God to have fellowship with him. But you, we have sinned and broken that fellowship. But God has reached back out to us 
through his son Jesus to offer forgiveness and reconciliation. And your response to this good news is to come home and accept it. And then live a life walking with God. And when you decide to repent, to come back home, God's response to your coming home is not a, not a lecture, not disappointment and anger. It's joy. Jesus tells the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15, showing the response of the father towards the homecoming of the sinful son. As the son who had taken his father's inheritance, squandered it, lived recklessly, hit rock bottom, slowly drags himself through the pasture with his home in sight, rehearsing his speech that he'd give to his father. His father runs out to meet him when he sees him. He can't even wait for his son to meander his way up onto the front porch. As his son mumbles his prepared confession of sin, his father can't help but just burst with joy at the fact of having his son back home. He welcomes him in for a feast and a celebration, not holding his disrespect or his past sins over his head. The son's repentance was coming back to the father. And the father's response was to welcome him back with joy. And this is true for any sinner who repents. Unbeliever, if you've never believed, this is true as he receives you with joy. Believer, if you have sin in your life that you need to repent of, when you come to Jesus, ask for forgiveness and to help you change, he receives you with joy again. And this means too, that while there is the reality of judgment for those who do not repent, your motivation for coming to Jesus does not simply have to be so that you can escape hell. This is a real factor, and John does not shy away from this in his preaching in the slightest. But think about what you are getting upon your repentance and who you are coming to. You are running back into the arms of your Creator, who is gentle and lowly in heart and will accept all those who come to Him and will never cast them out. He is a Savior and Lord who will also call you friend and delight to walk with you. He's a joyous shepherd who will be glad to have his wandering sheep back in the fold. And you don't have to have your sin problems all taken care of yet. You don't even have to have shown signs of improvement. We don't work to earn our salvation or Jesus' love. It's a gift given to those who come and ask. So just come to Jesus right where you are, as you are today. He is an alive and risen king sitting at the right hand of God and he will hear your prayer as you pray to him. And he will help you to live a life that produces fruit in keeping with repentance. John says that the people of the kingdom will be marked by living a life such as this. And as you walk with Jesus and Jesus with you, he is faithful to help you do this. You are not alone in this journey. And as you come to Jesus, your prayer might sound a little bit different than your neighbor. And that's all right. There's different people with different backgrounds and histories and struggles with sin in our lives. It is to be expected that we will approach Jesus from different angles of life. But what the text tells us is that the people sought repentance and forgiveness and began by confessing their sins and receiving baptism. This baptism was the sign of the beginning of a new life. The washing away of sin by forgiveness. It meant embracing the kingdom of heaven and living properly as a citizen of it. It was a commitment to producing fruit in keeping with repentance. So whatever angle you come from, from wherever and whatever, come to Jesus in repentance. Confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive and we all need forgiveness. Forgiveness seals our eternity with God and is the first step of repentance. Advent calls each of us to examine our lives and ask ourselves, where do I stand with God? Are there areas in my life that I need to repent and get back online with what Jesus wants for my life? Get back in line with living properly as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, which has come near. Maybe you're here in the room and you approach Jesus with the sin of, of never having believed in him as the son of God. You're coming to him for the first time. You've never asked him to forgive you of your sins and bring you into his kingdom family. You can ask him today 
to forgive you, to save you, to help you turn from your life of sin by the power of the Holy Spirit, which he will give to you. Or maybe you're here, you're online, and you realize that you spent your life riding the coattails of someone else's faith as an assurance of your own salvation. Or you think that you've been morally good enough that you really don't need to repent, that you don't actually have sin in your life. And you must realize that you can come from the best Christian family. You can be surrounded by believers of strong faith. You can have done the most selfless acts, which are good. But if you have never come to Jesus in repentance, acknowledged your sin, asked him to forgive you, you are not saved. But come to him today. And many of you are believers in the room. You have come to Jesus and asked him to forgive you of your sins, to bring you into his kingdom family. But maybe you have sins in your life right now that you need to repent of, to get back online with Jesus and what he wants for your life. You might be running from Jesus in some way at the moment in his desires for your life, pursuing a different way, pursuing your own way. God calls his people to live holy lives, both in the Old and the New Testaments, which means Jesus' forgiveness of your sins doesn't entitle you to live life however you please. This doesn't mean that we're going to live perfect lives as Christians, believe me, but it means that we strive for change. We strive to follow Jesus. Our trajectory in life is in a different direction in the world. It's towards obedience to Christ, following him and his will for our lives as the Spirit helps us to do this. Because we as believers are to be marked by producing fruit in keeping with repentance. Our trajectory may not be a smooth straight line. It's probably not. Sometimes we'll, we'll stumble and we'll fall and we're tempted to turn the other way. But in the words of Toby Mac, we lose our way, we get back up again. The reality is that even as followers of Jesus, we still struggle with sin. And we must continually come back to Jesus and ask him for forgiveness and help. Dane Ortland says this in his book, Gentle and Lowly, speaking of approaching Jesus with our sin. He says, with Christ, our sins and weaknesses are the very resume items that qualify us to approach him. First at conversion, and then a thousand times thereafter until we are with him upon death. So believer, in light of this Advent season and in recognition that Jesus' return, the second Advent could occur at any time, examine your lives. If Jesus were to return today, would you be ready for him? Would he look at you in your life and say, well done, good and faithful servant. From what angle must you come to Jesus today? Hear the words of Jesus to the church of Ephesus. Maybe you've lost your first love. Once on fire for Jesus and committed to doing his kingdom work, you've begun to place first priority on pursuing things of the world, such as money or status or pleasure or comfort. You've begun to love God's blessings more than the God who gives them or the things of this world more than the God who calls you to live in the world but not of it. Maybe you're pursuing the kingdom of the world, a different kingdom than living as a proper citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Maybe you have idols in your life. Our society throws a lot at us to try and grab our attention and draw us into pursuit of more and more of it. Sports, politics, material goods, maintaining a certain image, you name it. All things that can be good, but things that entice us to pursue them with greater eagerness than we might pursue God, our creator. Is there anything in your life that you feel you're pursuing in this way? Something that takes more of your zeal and energy and devotion than you give to your creator who loves you and sent his son to die for you. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Or maybe you're lukewarm. You were sitting idle, feeling rather indifferent about the kingdom of heaven and not much committed to doing the good works to which God has called you as a kingdom citizen. 
living in light of forgiveness of your sins and freedom to serve God and serve others. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Or maybe it's something else. Maybe it's a struggle with sexual immorality in some way, or greed, or, or selfishness, or pride. Or maybe God is calling you in some certain direction in your life, leading you down a certain path, and you've been resistant. Ask yourself, so what area in my life do I need to change and seek repentance in order to line up with God's will and live as a proper citizen of the kingdom of heaven? And if you come to realize an area in your life where you're in sin, come to Jesus. Unbeliever, believer, come to Jesus. Confess it to him. Ask for his forgiveness. Ask him to help you change. He will receive you with joy. And then consider confessing it to a trusted friend or to an accountability partner or a counselor or an accountability group. This has been tremendously helpful in my life and in the lives of many as people walk with you to help you bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And Jesus will use these people in your lives too. He will forgive you. He's faithful to work in your life and make you more like him. He'll receive you back with joy and he delights in you, not because of our greatness or our awesomeness, but because he chooses to love us and he gave his life for us. He'll walk with us until we are with him for all of eternity and there'll be no more need to change because sin will be out of existence. Praise God. And do it today. This is a command with urgency. While Jesus' first coming was upon John's original audience, his second advent is upon us. And like we learned last week, it will be like a thief in the night. We do not know the day or the hour in which it will come. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be 100 years from now. We don't know. But this is the day when Jesus will come as king to judge the world, to gather his sheep and send away the goats, where your position as a good tree or a bad tree is finalized, where your position as wheat or chaff is permanent. It's a day when each person will be rewarded for the works they did in this life. And that day, it will be too late to repent. At Christmas, we remember that Jesus came, a blessed hope. At Christmas, we remember that Jesus is coming again. So whoever you are and wherever you come from, what, whatever sin is going on in your life right now, don't wait. Don't hesitate. Come to the King. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for sending your son Jesus I ask that as we think about our lives that you search our hearts you would lead us in directions you call us that um, Lord you would, we would be obedient and we would repent of areas we need to repent Lord for those in here who may not know you I ask that you would stir in them a desire to come to you for who you are and what you've done for them for the believers in the room that are living life right now and maybe pursuing something that is contrary to your desires for their life, I ask that you would convict them by your spirit and draw them back to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I invite you today, if you do not know Jesus, to come to him. And believer, I invite you, if, if you do realize some sin in your life, to um, come to Jesus as well, to acknowledge that and ask his forgiveness and ask him to help you to change. You can text ACTION to 94,000. People will, will see that and reach out to you, or there'll be pastors at the front that would be willing to receive you, to pray with you, and to hear uh, what is going on in your life.